it'll be interesting, man. So guess what, man? It's about that time. We're going to be joined by our guest. And right now joining us here on The Stoop is actor Peter Cambor from the new Showtime series, Roadies. Peter, are you with us? I don't think he's with us yet. I'm right here. Oh, how you doing, Peter? Hey, what's up, man? How are you? Good. I want to thank you for uh, taking the time out of your schedule to uh, join us. And we finally got you on, so we're ecstatic, man. Yes, we are. Here we are. Ecstatic yeah. on this end as well. Yeah, great, man. So we'll we'll jump right into it, man. Uh, we, we, we really want to learn some more about Rhodey. So you star as Milo on the new Showtime series, Rhodey's. Can you tell us a little bit about the show and the character you play in it? Yeah, so Rhodey's is sort of a behind-the-scenes look at the, uh, at the tour for a rock band a fictional rock band called the State and House Band, and it's about all the sort of techs and roadies that sort of make a show possible. And it's a real sort of under-the-hood, behind-the-scenes look. And I play Milo, who is the bass tech for the bassist in the band. And Milo's kind of a technical wizard, sort of know-how, you know, multitasking guy who's also very sort of conspiratorial, paranoid, and uh, is from New Jersey but thinks he's from England. He's a sort of complicated and comedic character, to say the least. Yeah. Yeah. So I'm guessing you got the uh, the English accent to go along with it, huh? I do. I do indeed, yeah. Well, you know, it's funny. He goes in and out of it because people call him out on it sometimes. So it's, it's kind of an affectation. The storyline Cameron gave me was that he was with uh, Elvis Costello on tour before he joined this band. So it, when he was on that tour, he sort of adopted the lilt. And it's funny, it's one of those things where, like, you know, it's, it's a good comedic device, but you have to sort of make it real in your own way. So I kind of had this little backstory that Milo kind of, you know, he plays music himself and has a little roadie band, and he secretly sort of wants to be on the stage. So I think he sort of adopts the people's personalities he's around uh, whenever it is, sort of suits him best in some way. Yeah. Is this the first time that you're having to do an accent? Do you have, like, the Dick Van Dyke British accent, or are you, are you pretty on spot with your <laughs> English accent? <laughs> I'd say it's a little more like a Christopher Guest, like Nigel Spinal Tap sort of accent. There you go. It's like you know, it's not, yeah, yeah. you know, it's like you know, it's, it's a little thing. You know, it's like this. It's a little, <laughs> you know, he's a little neuro- He's a little scared of everyone. So it's yeah. kind of it's a means ridiculous, right? And then uh, it's not the first time I've an accent. Oddly enough, I was I was cast as like some like, you know, blue collar like Italian guy from New York on like an episode of something once, which is hysterical because it's like so not my vibe and I was like and you know you get the parts like that you go, you're going to be the leader of a crime family like a, an Italian crime family from Brooklyn you're like what where did anyone get that idea <laughs> but uh, you know you just do what you're told right <laughs> yeah yeah oh man that's hilarious all right, so now the cast on this show is absolutely phenomenal. So what's it like working with somebody like Luke Wilson and my personal favorite Carla Gugino? Okay. Uh, Luke Wilson is exactly as you think. He's got this kind of great folksy sort of sensibility. We're both Texans, so we sort of have that in common. Oh, nice. But Luke, is, yeah. has, Luke has this unbelievable comedic sensibility that's just like, and he kind of draws you in at his own pace and kind of does his own thing. He just is like a one-liner, like one-liner after another on set. It's really funny because he's so sort of subtle and low-key and he'll just drop these little bombs on you and you're just like dying laughing and then you know carla is just like as as her character is on it she's just a total consummate professional and a real like i don't know know, just she's like a she's like an audrey hepburn like kind of like vibe she's just a classic all-time actress you know what i mean definitely yeah and then machine machine gun kelly uh colson baker who like one of my favorite takes from this whole show is getting to have a relationship with him because i I don't think in, in any world the world in any other world where our like lives have crossed paths, but he's become one of my like really really close friends, and you know mm-hmm. he's this like really intense hip hop star from Cleveland, and I'm like this you know this kind of tall beefy guy from Houston, Texas, and it's just really funny <laughs> that I got like, grew up listening to country music, and like here I am like hanging out with like a sort of like a, a totally like you know rock star hip hop dude, it's pretty cool, and everyone else is just <laughs> unbelievable. Just, you know our cold cast became a little bit like a family, and that's kind of like what the show is about. It's a big part of it is how these guys get so close on tour and all that. Yeah, definitely. So, you know, I wanted to ask you this. I know most people would probably know you as Nate Getz from NCIS Los Angeles, uh, you know, right off the bat as soon as they see your face. So 
How is it going from a show like NCIS to a show like Roadies? Is there like a difference in the way you have to handle things and in the way you act and, you know, present yourself on screen? Yeah, I think definitely. You know, the thing about doing something like NCIS LA is I've done that for such a long time. And um, part of it is just like a, a show like that, when you've been doing it for several years, like, and those guys are unbelievable. The crew is so tight. The cast is so tight. Like, everyone kind of knows their stuff and its pacing. So you kind of are going through it like, you just kind of know it and you're expected to know it and you're supposed to know what your guy would do and know what your character would do and know how he'd react. So you're going through and you're just busting it out and everyone's just kind of like, you have your rhythms with your people. Like, I know people like Eric Christian Olsen and Chris O'Donnell and Daniela Wheeler and we have our rhythms and just all that's kind of been in place and we've each other for a long time. And whenever you're starting something new, you got to sort of find those rhythms. And especially with the character, like it takes, it takes a couple of episodes to kind of figure out like, oh, this is, okay, now I think I got what the guy is. So you're kind of like, everyone's kind of trying to figure out what everything is at first. And it's a really interesting, exciting time and show because, mm. you know, it, it becomes like this real, you're sitting there and you're sitting with Cameron Crowell and you're like, what do you think about this? And he's like, I don't know. What do you think about this? And you guys have to kind of come up with a thing together. It's a real, like, you know, it, it's, it's very intense, but it's very creative and it's very just kind of, it's a living, breathing thing. So I guess that's the primary difference just by virtue of being something new. And then obviously the tone of the show is so different. In the sense yeah. that it's kind of a comedy and it's more heartfelt. And, like, you know, in CSLA, it is, you know, it is an action sort of show. So it's very much like this is what's going on. We're driving the plot forward. We've got to get the bad guy. It's very kind of intense. You're dealing with, like, yeah. terrorism and, like, crime and everything like this. And this is obviously, like, it's about important things, but it's definitely on the more lighthearted side. Very cool. So now we got to talk beards. I'm a beard guy. Jeff isn't a beard guy. He hasn't been able to grow a beard since probably he was about 14 years old. Um, I'm an old beard guy. Here. <laughs> That's an impressive stat. You could grow yeah, beard isn't it? It's amazing. <laughs> but anyway, I was reading an interview um, about your beard, which is pretty funny, and you said in it that um, you had to grow a gigantic, food-absorbing beard. So my question to you is, is the itching finally over? Um, the itching has subsided, but I don't think the itching will ever be over. It's like a giant <laughs> rash on the face. I mean, it's, you know what I mean? It's just like, and it, it's like, it's a foreign part of me. It's like, it's, it's like a different creature that needs to eat and drink and do its own. It has its own diet. You know what I mean? And basically, whatever doesn't make it into my mouth somehow gets taken in by the beard and will be there for, you know, weeks, if not months on end. Thank God, oh, yeah. you know, I'm married. I have somebody to, uh, make sure that that doesn't happen. But it is kind of like, and it was like a baseball diamond. You just kind of constantly have to be tending it. So it's just perfect yes. and not a mess. Right. Absolutely, man. So now is it at that point where you kind of hope Milo probably dies in a bus accident so you can shave it or is the show more important than the beard? That's a great one. Yeah. Please kill me off so I can shave my beard. Please. <laughs> Please, I'd, I'd prefer being unemployment than uh, having a beard. No, it's not a really tough thing. But I do see dropping things. Like, I'm like, what if Milo went, like, really, like, slick? Like, what if he went down a kind of, like, you know, young Beatles road or something like that? You know, maybe that was the thing. And, of course, that never uh, happens. You know, it's funny. Like, the second week after I got this part, Cameron emailed me. He was like, I think you have a beard. And I'm like, you know, of course, what are you going to say? You're just like, Cameron Crow wants you to have a beard? You're going to have a beard. So... Oh, but man. it's funny. You know, be... I, I, I like it, and it's, it's it's fun because it's like it's a totally different sort of vibe for me. And it just is, you know, I, I walk into like a gas station on like a road trip, and everyone like is scared of you a little more than maybe before. So like, things like that are fun. You know what I mean? I'm six five, and with a beard, you'd immediately become like six ten, and like another twenty pounds heavier. <laughs> <laughs> well, and a lot know. hotter too. So yeah, and, and warmer. Yeah, temperature wise. Yeah, yeah. exactly. Well, who knows? Maybe on the next episode of uh, Roadies or, you know, down the line, they figure out, well, you're, you know, thinking that you're English, you can be the next Simon Le Bon and you can shave it and go your Duran Duran roots, man. It would be, it would be nice, but exactly, I don't think that's exactly, that. yeah. <laughs> Duran Duran roots, right. I like it all. <laughs> I read also that uh, you, you play guitar, so... I was going to ask you before I read that, you know, were you really into music before you got onto a show like this? So, you know, I read that you play guitar and you play with a country band while you were in college. Is country the thing that does it for you? What kind of, you know, music are you into and what really pumps you up? 
Well, you know, when I, well, growing up, I was I, my dad was a big, big jazz and blues guy, and so I, my initial kind of entry into music was a lot of that. My, my first CD, my dad bought me was like a Lightning Hopkins and like a Howlin' Wolf and like a Muddy Waters CD. Nice. So I just really kind of like, and then also living in Houston, Texas, where I was like a stone's throw away from Austin, it's kind of all of that was really still kind of in its heyday. Like Stevie Ray Vaughan was still playing there. When I was in high school, we'd sort of drive over to Austin. And, um, you know, South by had, had not become such a huge thing yet. So you could kind of go in and see like amazing bands and it didn't cost you an arm and a leg. Bands were just sort of playing everywhere. And so it just kind mm-hmm. of exposed that scene. I think when, when I was first started playing guitar, like everyone in Houston, we all just wanted to be like Stevie Ray Vaughan. Oh, and yeah. then as I sort of got older and got into sort of indie music and, you know, I think a grunge really was had a big influence on me and Nirvana and Pearl Jam. And then I think when I got to college, actually, like I started like you know in, in my kind of in a real way of coping with my homesickness from Texas. I went to college in Connecticut. I started mm-hmm. listening to a lot of Willie Nelson and all this music that I sort of heard growing up and Hank Williams. I like really really old country music and kind of a little more offbeat, kind of like outlaw country. And I think that really began to sort of affect my musical palette and then realizing that those guys were so sort of hand in hand responsible for and kind of very similar to people that I like, like Bob Dylan and you know, some stuff that the Rolling Stones were doing with their sort of a country experiments and that. So yeah. I think all mm. of that has been through that, but really kind of, I guess we could, you would call it Americana now, but I just like that kind of bootsy country sound, you know? Yeah. So basically just a whole hubbub of a lot of things just, you know, mixed in. So that's pretty cool. Very nice. Yeah, um, I think so. I think it's, it's definitely. Yeah. Well, I, it, listen, I mean, it's good to be, I guess, eclectic in your taste, especially uh, being an actor. I mean, you have to do so many different roles and be so many different people. So it's so I'm guessing it's nice even on the music scene to, you know, to like so many different things and be open to it, right? Yeah, I think that, uh, that's a great way of putting it, actually, because I think that, look, every time you take a, on a part, it's a little bit like going to class or something. You know what I mean? Like you have to go yeah. and investigate all aspects that that character would do, and you kind of are open to a whole of the world. And it's a really exciting thing to go and do a kind of wide variety of parts because you learn all sorts of stuff. Like you know, on Jazz LA, I learned all about occupational psychology, and like I met a guy who does my who does Nate's job at NCIS, and that's like a really mm-hmm. interesting thing. He's like an expert in threat assessment, and he's you know the first guy on the scene whenever there's some huge thing happens he's like one of the guys who's there like how cool is that and then you know even if it's something like the other show i've done like you know the wedding band was a show i did on tvs and like you get to go and you know you guys who actually have that life you know playing like wedding bands and stuff like that who play in like event plans and like that's a whole crazy world in and of itself and then so i think that definitely like, all that stuff definitely the eclecticness i just think you you begin to become a bit of a sponge and you sort of soak up the world around you as you move forward as an actor. Yeah, yeah. Well, going back to acting now, um, as we said earlier, you're, you know, you're working next to Luke Wilson and Carla Gugino, and, and seriously, you you worked next to a laundry list of amazing people from, uh, you know, Ella Cool J and Chris O'Donnell, the amazing and brilliant Linda Hunt, who I absolutely love, and then Lily Tomlin and Jane Fonda, which is, is, is absolutely amazing. Oh. Has there been that one person – or that one actor or actress that you just couldn't believe you were working with and you got a little nervous around? I mean, to be honest with you, the, that person is definitely like Cameron Crow. <laughs> like, oh, really? Okay. Like, growing up, I was so obsessed with, like, his stuff. Like, I just had, he had been sort of unknowing, unbeknownst to me on some level. Like, you know, starting with Fast Times at Richmond High, saying anything, singles, and Jerry Maguire and Almost Famous, which is this whole line of movies that I just kind of speckled my entire kind of upbringing from childhood to sort of adolescence into being a young adult. And mm-hmm. when I got the audition originally, I was sort of like, oh, this, you know, sometimes you get these auditions. And for me, I was like, well, this is never going to happen because I love to do stuff and it never works out that way. We're like, you're like, oh, this guy's amazing. I'm going to look out. And then, you know, when I met him in the audition, I was like, oh, I can't believe I'm actually like meeting him now. And then it kind of went along and then you're pinching yourself and you're like, you're on a show with him and he's coming out to me like, so what do you want to do in this scene? You're like, do you ask me what I want to do? I'm like, ah, like it's, just, it's one of those things you're just completely like starstruck. And like, he's just such a great guy too that it's such a strange thing because I, I find myself just completely like biting my tongue. I'm like, I don't know. Like I'm like speechless. 
Tell me what you want me to do. I'll just do whatever you tell me to do. But definitely came growing that way. And Jane Fonda you... definitely to an extent because like she was so like iconic and then but she's so cool and Fran Lily are so awesome and they're kind of just these old school like actresses and they tell great stories and you know, there's I don't know, they're just kind of badasses, you know what I mean? Like that's yeah. You just kind of yeah, go well, around them and you just let them take the, you just follow their lead. You're like, Yes, I will just follow you in the battle, Jane Fonda, Lily Tomlin. Yeah, I mean, it's a phenomenal show. I, I absolutely love that show. I watch it constantly, and I even keep re-watching it as I'm done with it. So now when you're doing roadies and you mess up a line or something happens, do you ever look over your shoulder, you know, over at Cameron and be like, uh-oh, you know, <laughs> I don't want to disappoint him. I, use, I, usually, I usually curse profusively, hit myself <laughs> in the head, and just plow back into it. That's generally my – everyone has their own way of doing it. Yeah. Screwing up a line like that. So that's, that's definitely my way, and I'm just like, oh, God, let's just get through this. <laughs> Let's get through this day. <laughs> All right. So now, as an actor, and as you know, you know, when you were coming up, and as an aspiring actor, what have you always wanted to do? Is there like a dream part you wish you can play, or someone you wish you can act alongside that would be like, you know, your just crowning achievement that you could say, well, now I've pretty much done everything. Oh wow. Great question, man. I, I guess there's a part of me that would love to ha- be in that kind of like massive, epic, like battle scene or something. I think it's just kind of the boy in me. It's just that huge, like, you know, 10 cameras going. There's a play, they have to time it with the airplane coming overhead, and you're mm-hmm. just doing some massive, there's like a, you know, a thousand people on like a field and you're like a part of that thing. Cause I think it's the, the most exciting thing about filmmaking and making TV shows is like, you're a part of this really large apparatus. And even as yeah. an actor, even though the focus is on us, you're just like kind of a spoke in the wheel with all these guys. And there's like 150 crew on, you know, working in any given time on a, a roadies day. And like, just, but to have something of that scope where it's like, it's to, I mean, the feeling of accomplishment that must have been, after shooting something like the opening to Saving Private Ryan, you know what I mean? Like something yeah. that massive. And mm-hmm. like all of a sudden, the, the explosions of this, just being, up, being able to have that notch on the belt of being like, wow, I was in the Lawrence of Arabia scene, or I was in the, that, to be in some iconic, massive scene would be just really exhilarating and just, you know, a great thing to sort of have on, you know, your resume. It's just like, I did that in my life. I think that'd be super cool. Something like that. Yeah, yeah. Now, would it be a nice war scene like that, guns and tanks, or would you go Game of Thrones style, man, swords wielding and horses running? I mean, you know, what's you know, what's guns, that I big thing you would like to do? Guns and tanks are more my style. Guns and tanks yeah. are definitely more my style. I appreciate yeah. the swords and everything like that, but I'd rather it be like you know, on a horse, swinging a pistol, or like in a tank in a jeep. I don't know anything like that. Like, yeah, for yeah. sure. I know it's just like that. That was a thing. Like growing up, you played. In Texas, you played like you were a soldier or something like that. Some sort of, hmm. a lot of the acting stuff is kind of based on these kind of childish fantasies you like to keep going. And I feel like glorifying of that, but just to like, you know what I mean? There's something about that. Like it's like the West, like I used to love spaghetti westerns and Clint Eastwood movies. Like that would be amazing. Like being a bad guy in a western would be great. Yeah. Now, before I let you go, I have to ask you this one. I was uh, on IMDb earlier looking at your profile, which, you know, I, I'm, I'm addicted to IMDb. So some of the stuff's good, some of the stuff isn't. But I read that you were filming a movie kind of based on uh, September 11th. And, uh, you know, I wanted to ask you how intense this movie is. Me, I'm from New York City. I lived through uh, September 11th. I was, you know, 15 minutes from the World Trade Center. And just wow. looking at the, uh, you know, synopsis of this movie – it sounds intense. So how is it intense for you to do this movie, considering that I know you as well have some ties in New York since you lived there for a little bit? Yeah, I, I was in Queens. You know, I lived in Long Island City when it happened. So I was, you know, as, in New as York. As was I. As was I. Yeah, crazy. I was, I was yeah. nowhere near the buildings, but I was in Queens yeah. and, like, went outside and saw the whole mess. Yeah. So, so as, yeah. as you know, and being in New York and everything like that, it obviously, and that was the year I graduated from college. So I sort of moved oh, wow. to New York, and then immediately yeah. that sort of happened. So it was, it was a kind of a major sort of life moment, and yeah. you know, it just the whole world changed. I mean, you're like 21 years old, and like just entering the world like that. So for me, what was you know the biggest take from it was how 
what it was like in the month or two months afterwards, I'm sure you remember, but just how frightening it all was. Absolutely. How wounded the city was, but also how strong the city was in the way in which it bounced back. But also just it was a really paranoid, like scary time. And I remember like I got on the subway and it just felt differently every time I was on the subway and I get into a really crowded subway cars and my adrenaline would spike up. So everyone just was a little on edge. Yeah. And this movie is very, very intense. And it's, you know, I think it, it'll resonate now on some level just in the sense of, you know, the par- paranoia and all of that is in many cases justifiable and it's a human response. And I definitely was paranoid then. But, you know, to, to act upon that totally without, you know, judge or jury is a, is a, is a dangerous kind of road to walk down. And I think that the movie is about somebody who is very much affected by the attacks, who then sort of yeah. takes justice into his own hands in a particular way. And it's an interesting commentary. And, I, and my, a friend of mine wrote it, and he wrote it years ago. And it kind of makes sense that now is the time that it's getting made in some weird way, that all that's kind of coming back up in a certain way. And, like, you know, it doesn't it doesn't support any theories or anything like that. It's just kind of yeah, what it is. Yeah. But I just definitely remember, as you remember, like, you remember, it was like, it was totally, like, crazy after that. Oh, it, it was insane. Like, yeah. It was just insane. And, no, and, and, and that, those two months were just unlike any other I've ever experienced. And yeah. just because like a raw nerve. I remember, but I remember like things like I saw, like going into like a bar. It was the first baseball game after the thing happened, and like everyone in the yeah. bar, it was, uh, it was opening pick. Everyone in the bar stood up to sing the national anthem. Like shit that I'll never forget. You know what I mean? Mm-hmm. Absolutely. And I got great strength, and also you know the horrible loss and everything that happened too. So. Yeah. Uh, you know, you were talking about the uh, you know the whole being on edge and everything. Um, were you living in New York in 2003 during that blackout? You know, I was I, I just moved out of town, and I remember when uh, it happened. All my, yeah. my buddy phones out, and was, yeah, so tell me about that. That must have been crazy. no, I, no. I was I was going to say because like you were saying on edge, and as soon as everything went out, I mean, I, I was driving down. Uh, I was in Queens on Grand Avenue in Maspeth, and uh, we were driving down, and every single traffic light went out. And we went to the radio, and only very few radio stations were coming, and they were starting to say how we were under a terrorist attack, and they were hitting the, you know, you know, the nuclear plant on Indian Island, and doing, and, you know, everybody was freaking out because we didn't know where it was coming from, from what angle, whatever. So as you were saying that, you know, it's 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 weird, and not many people can realize. I I think you needed to be near it as you and I were, and actually had you know, to you know, to have seen it in front of our face, but. It, man, just just the feeling of that, that's something that is, even when you talk about it today, it kind of comes back and you, you can kind of feel that feeling again. It, it, was, it was a scary time. Well, I think it, was, the, it was a scary time. And I think the thing you're talking about, too, is that after that happened and, like, the mm-hmm. craziness of us planes flying into the Trade Center, anything was possible after that. So I yes. remember 1010 10 Winds broadcasting, like, everything they were getting on the police scanner in the days after the attack. And there were stories yes. about terrorists on the GW Bridge. And all these, mm-hmm. remember there was like the 18 wheels on the GW bridge with explosives. Yes. They were reporting everything. And at that point, you were like, well, it's completely possible. I just witnessed the most impossible thing ever to happen. So, and yeah. all bets are off. So, as soon as you start hearing that, you're just like, you really, if you were there for it, in some capacity, mm-hmm. especially there afterwards, then you really could believe anything. So, I, I know exactly what you're talking about. Yeah. It, 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 it amazes me that. Not only were we both there, but we were both in the same town pretty much with our eyes right on everything happening. So that's a uh, small world. <laughs> small world, yeah. Totally crazy, right? Here we are. Uh, yeah, absolutely small world. Well, listen, Peter, I, I want to thank you for taking the time out of your hectic schedule for jumping on here with us tonight and uh, talking about everything going on in your career. Uh, to our listeners, you can catch uh, Roadies on Showtime this Sunday with a new episode, uh, 10 p.m. Eastern Times. Check your local listings. Peter, I would I would love to have you back on in the near future, man. Oh, my, it would be my pleasure, man. Thanks so much. Really appreciate it. Thank, thank you so you. much, Peter. Have a great night. We'll talk to you soon. Thanks. Thanks. Man. Bye-bye. And that was actor Peter Cambor from Showtime's Roadies, man. Uh, awesome guy. Really enjoyed speaking with him, Jeff. I'm blown away that we were in the same place during 9-11, man. 